All right. Well, we're going to start off part one of our series, Easter series, the Easter season where the most people come to the faith in Christ. Because really, this season is about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The culmination of his 33 and a half years of ministry on this earth is coming to this pivotal moment where he goes to the cross. He takes on the sins of all of humanity, past, present, and future. But through the power of God, raised his son, Jesus Christ, up from the dead. And the power of his resurrection comes to a place where it breaks sin and death over our lives. And anyone that would come into a relationship with Jesus Christ that would receive him into their heart. The blood of Jesus cleanses them from all of their sin. And when they come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, they have eternal life. And that's what this season is all about. I want you to get excited about this season. That the family and friends that don't know Christ in your relational circle, your business partners, your family, the people on your sports team, the parent that, that is with you every Sunday or every Saturday afternoon on the fields of sports with your children, that they are going to encounter the love of Christ. They're going to encounter God's presence, and they're going to see the destiny and purpose of God fulfilled and revealed in their life. But it starts with us expressing the gospel, ministering to His grace, being agents of love to see people change. Can I hear amen? And this is the season to do it. Turn to the neighbor next to you. It's the last time, I promise, for the next five minutes, you'll turn and tell them this. Come on, we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. Well, <clears throat> we start this new series called Promises. And I love this about Jesus Christ. One of his greatest promises that he declared to his disciples is true to us today. And it is actually found in the last words when he is about to leave this earth after 33 and a half years of earthly ministry. He's about to leave his disciples leave everything to the disciples, and, and he knew that they were going to take the gospel to the four ends of the earth. But he said this, that there are, my promise is that I will be with you. And how many are so glad that God is with us, that he'll never leave us, that he'll never forsake us. But it's wrapped around in Matthew 28, his last words, we call the Great Commission to all of us. And I'm going to read it. I don't believe it's on screen, but Matthew 28 says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Everybody say all. All. That means every people group. People who are different backgrounds, financially, socially, ethnically, in your circle, those are the people that God wants you to make disciples of, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At the conference, we had 10 young people be baptized. They were baptized in water. And, and on Saturday night, a lot of people were filled with the Holy Spirit, and we're going to do that tonight. We're going to open up the altar so that you can get filled, refilled, and overflowing with the power, and the, or the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to do that teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So here is our part, to go and make disciples, to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, to teach people and, and, and become disciple makers, trained followers, disciplined followers of Christ. That is our part. But I love his promise Right here, at the end of all of that, as you do your part, disciples, as church, you do your part, guess what? I'm going to do my part. And verse 20 says, behold, I am with you always. Everybody say always. Always to the end of the age. So here we find our part, our responsibility to go and make disciples, not to go and have a great portfolio, not to go and have a great marriage, not to go and have your kids become NFL all-stars. That's great. Can I hear amen? That's great. But really, our main mission in our life and our responsibility is to go and make disciples. That's the singular mission that God has placed all of us on this earth to do. And as we do that, our human responsibility, then he comes in with his responsibility. and says, as you do that, my promise is that I will be with you. 
I will guide you. I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will give you the needs that you need in your life. How many can say that's, a, that's with a great amen? Hallelujah. So we do our part, and God fulfills his part. So let me leave you with three components of that. First of all, in the promise of his presence, he dwells with us and in us. He is with us, but he's also in us. And here's the word, that, that, the word picture that comes to mind. Jesus departed this earth after 33 and a half years. He went up to heaven. The Bible says he sits at the right hand of God. Okay, this is your right. This is my, this is my right. That's your right. So I'll put it here. <laughs> Here's Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. He's interceding for us. But he said, I want to be with you. So how am I going to be with you? You must be thinking, how, Jesus, how will Jesus be with me if he's in heaven? Well, the agent or the vehicle of God's presence is the Holy Spirit. And Scripture says in John chapter 14, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Here's Jesus' words. To be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. God's Spirit resides in you. When you come into a relationship with him, when you give your life eternally to, to him, his presence resides and abides in you. As Jesus approached the cross, his departure was promised. He said, I promise to send someone back for you, to be with you. Right, John 16, not, and again, not on, not on the, the screen here, says, he said this, I must go back. He told his disciples John 16, I must go to my Father. I must. Strong imperative word. I must go back to my Father. But when I go, I promise to send back the Holy Spirit to be with you. That's why Jesus can say in the Bible, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It was a holy tag team. <laughs> It's like tag team wrestling. I'm going to go there. Now, Holy Spirit, you come here. Tag, you're it. Continue the work of God in people's lives. And I love that. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Through the Holy Spirit, he will dwell with us. He will dwell with us. And he will be in us as we believe and receive him. Let me ask this question. Maybe in your daily life, in your endeavors, your activities, Maybe you have kind of felt God with you. Have you ever felt just God, just God's just with me. I just feel his presence. You can't grab it. You can't see it. You can't taste it. Your five senses tells you that there is nothing there. But inside of you, there's a knowing that, no, God is with me. God is with me in this board meeting. God is with me as I teach these students. God is with me as I listen to my instructor. God is with me as I do my business activities. How many of you ever felt that? That God was just kind of just with you? Okay, two of you. Really, how many felt like this driving? You just sense God's God in the car. And all of a sudden, you just start tearing up. You just start tearing up like, wow. Okay, it's not the onions I just ate with that hamburger. All right? You just sense God's presence with you. There's a sense of peace. Maybe for some of you, you might face, you've been facing a turmoil in your life. A, a hard time in your life. And as you're just walking through life, all of a sudden you sense God's peace. There's just a calm about you. That's the Holy Spirit working in us because he promises that he would be with us. Maybe you face a situation where you had no words to speak. You know, you've been there. Maybe it's somebody that's grieving and you have no words to speak. Or maybe it's somebody that's confronting you. You have no words to speak. You're lost for words. Then all of a sudden, something triggers or fires up inside of you. Scriptures start to come out. The Word of God starts to come out. The promises of His Word start to come out. And all of a sudden, you have this thought. 
Man, that's not me speaking. That's somebody else speaking through my voice, using my mouth. That's the Holy Spirit working in your life. That as He resides in you, really, He wants to come out of you and to be shared to people around you. Can I hear amen? Maybe you faced a difficult decision recently, or you're going to face a difficult decision. In James 3, it says, The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom which is from above. You know, sometimes, and it's not based on your age. It's not based on your intellect. It's not based on even your previous experiences experiences in life. There's just a divine wisdom that just comes out of nowhere, and we know it comes from God. And as God sends his kind of the wisdom conduit through the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden we're like, oh, yeah, where did that thought come from? Where did that idea come from? Where did that thing come from? And we realize it's not, it's not coming from us, not from previous experiences, but it's coming from the Holy Spirit working in and through our lives. You know, this is what... Now, that's your question. This is a water bottle, okay? I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do like breath full or drink the whole thing. I, you know, I don't know how he did it. He did it in all the services on Sunday. I'm like, dude, that's a lot of water going in your stomach, okay? I don't think he did it Saturday night. But this is water. Our lives are like this container, all right? right. And he did this illustration. I love it. When we are shaken, what happens? Water comes out. What's inside will come out, right? In our lives, when we go through hard times, what's in our life, if it's the Holy Spirit, good things will come out of our life. And it would be such a blessing, even though you might be going through a hard time, when the water or the Holy Spirit comes out and pours out and splashes out on people around you, they're going to be blessed. But if there's nothing inside of it, when this is shaken, what happens? Nothing happens. It's a bunch of hot air. (laughs) Right? So that's the reason why when God says, I leave and go to heaven, I'm going to leave back here on earth to be with you and be in you, my Holy Spirit, so that when you are shaken, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit is evident. The Holy Spirit splashes out out of your life onto other people. That's the power and the promise of his presence. Oh, my hands are all wet now. <laughs> right? I'm gonna, I hope I got this right. I kind of Googled it to make sure, right? If you don't know anything, just Google. And hopefully they're, they're right. Well, they say this. Uh, doctors, like any doctors or, or, or health practitioners in the house, nurses, whatever, okay? They say this, that you can survive and live without food for about 21 days, three weeks. Yeah, I, I disagree with that. I can't live without food for three hours. Okay, that was a joke, okay? All right? Those of you watching online, laugh online. You know, we, 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 we can survive and live without food for about three weeks, all right? The longest fast I ever done, okay, without food was 21 days, and I survived, Okay, I don't know the grace of God, the Holy Spirit moving in my life, but I survived. It wasn't too bad. So we know medically we can survive without food for 21 days. But they say this, without water, you won't be able to survive three to four days. Maybe seven if you're in a great climate and you're in great shape. But without water, you won't be able to survive three or four days. In the same way, without the power of the Holy Spirit, which is like water, the Bible says, references the Holy Spirit like water. If it is not being, if we're not being filled up daily with His presence, daily in His Word, daily in prayer, daily in in, in community, guess what happens? We're going to dry up. And pretty soon when we're shaking, nothing is going to come out. Of our lives, and we won't have an impact with other people around us. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit came upon the people that were praying in the upper room. 
the encounter, right? The Bible says tongues like holy fire on their, on their lips, speaking multiple languages, all in a spiritual language, which we call now tongues, okay, the Holy Spirit language. But it also didn't happen just in Acts 2. It happened in Acts 4. Sometimes in our life, we think when we come to Christ, it's a one-time experience being filled with the Spirit. With being filled with the Spirit. No, it's an ongoing filling of the Holy Spirit that we need in order to survive, thrive, and overcome. Can I hear amen? That means every day we are filled with the Spirit. At work, you're being filled with the Spirit. The next day, you, you get up, you get filled with the Spirit again. You pour it out, and the next day you wake up again, guess what? You are filled with the Spirit again. And then you pour it out, and the next day you are what? Filled with the Spirit again. Because He's with us, and He is in us, and wants to come through us and touch the world around us. Can I hear amen? Second thing is this. Not only does He promise that He will be with us and in us, He promises that He will save us. He will save us. Scripture says in Titus 3, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Meaning this, He made us whole. We were fractured in our soul. We were separated in a relationship with God the Father. But because of His Son, He saved us and He made us whole. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. We can't do it by our good works. But according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, or which means rebirth. There's a rebirth when you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You are born again. You might have heard that phrase. And there is a renewal, which is a complete change in our hearts because of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let me break this down. Our spirit is saved and justified, meaning it's made righteous. You know, some people have asked, well, you know, I can't come to Christ. You know, the things that I've done in my past, if I come and walk into the church, the church might burn down. I tell this, right, a story of Pastor Billy says his, one of his best friends tells him, I can't come to the church because the church will burn down. He tells them this, well, great, guess what? We have great fire insurance and we have great fire sprinklers. Don't worry about it. Just come into the church. And so in our lives, we are made righteous when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We are cleaned up. We are set free. We are born again. Romans 8, 16 says this. For his spirit, write this down in your notes. Romans 8, 16. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm, to validate that we are God's children. So when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are initially filled with the Holy Spirit. And the moving of the Holy Spirit, the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the sense of His presence, the sense of newfound joy, the sense of newfound grace, the sense of newfound peace, working in and through your life, that is the confirmation or the affirmation of the Holy Spirit saying that you are God's children. That's the reason why when you give your life to Christ, you might be like, wow, I, I, have, I, have a greater, I have a greater sense of peace. The situations and circumstances around my life haven't changed. Maybe have gotten worse. I've known stories of people when they gave their life to Christ, it seemed like all hell broke loose. But as they were walking through hell, they walked through hell with a greater sense of peace. And that they knew that the power of the Holy Spirit was confirming and affirming that they were now a son and daughter of God. Can I hear men? Come on. Some of you get excited. Come on. Man, I'm trying to wake you up on a Saturday night. Some of you like look comatose. All right. We're going to have you start bringing coffee into the, the worship center. Amen. All right. Just joking. Yeah, wow. That's the loudest amen I heard all night. Woo! Man. Well, our spirit is saved. And our spirit is, is justified, made righteous. But there is another component of our makeup. It's our soul. 
our soul is comprised of three different components. It's our mind, how we think, yeah? the paradigms of our, of our thinking. It's our will, our decision-making process. How, we, how do we make decisions? Our will, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And sometimes it's the battle of our will that, that God is trying to work in our life through his Holy Spirit working in us. And also the third component is our emotions, our feelings, Nothing more than feelings. All right? All right. All right. Thanks, all the Filipinos. Enjoy that song. All right? It's made of three components, our mind, our will, and our emotions. Our soul. What? Well, our soul is being saved. It's being made whole. It's being sanctified or set apart gradually over time. This is the, pro this is the, the word called sanctification. There is justification. Your spirit is saved. You're going to go to heaven. You, you're saved from hell. But in that sanctification process, it's a work. And I love what Coach says. Pastor Coach Alfredo, who, who's right now ministering to our Every Nation Church Las Vegas this weekend, he says this, sanctification is a progress. And it's not perfection that we're looking for. It is a progress in your relationship, in your faith in Jesus Christ. Can you hear amen? So what is the Holy Spirit's part in this? Right under the scripture, Ephesians 1.13 Ephesians 1.13 says, it, it, it pretty, pretty much says the Holy Spirit is the seal or the stamp of approval, not only affirms or confirms you, your salvation, but the Holy Spirit is the seal, God's seal of salvation in your life. So the focus of the Holy Spirit is to progressively sanctify you in your experiences, in your dealings, in your relationships, when you are tested, when you feel like things aren't going the way you desire, as you turn your life over to Christ and as you continue to follow him, the work of the Holy Spirit is sanctifying or purifying our lives and our soul. So that at the end, at the end, the Bible says, right, Jesus is coming back for his bride. A spotless bride coming back. But pastor, you don't know where I'm at right now. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel worthy. I feel actually kind of spotted in life. But as we continue to let the Holy Spirit work in us, save us, regenerate us, sanctify us, set us apart for his work and his glory, guess what? He's cleaning us. So that one day when Jesus comes, he's going to look at you and say, you're my perfect bride. He's going to look at you. You're my perfect bride. He's going to look at you. You're my perfect bride. Can I hear amen? That's a glorious, glorious. And last thing, and I leave you with this. I wanted to preach short tonight because we're going to open up the altar. Some of you just got a little antsy already. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. We're going we're gonna to lock the doors and chain the doors. Go ahead, William. Do it now. They're not looking. Last thing is this. He transforms us. He transforms us. The power of the Holy Spirit transforms. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. Again, Jesus validates himself. It is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're all three. And where the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. There is freedom. There is liberty. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. When sin came into the Garden of Eden, our image was distorted. Right? When, Jesus, when God created us, he says, let's make man in our image. But when sin came and separated our relationship with God, the, our image of who we are, our soul was distorted. And God says, guess what? We're going to change them. I'm going to come, and I'm going to have my spirit working in your life so that you can be transformed back into the same image. Back into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. 
How many think that's such a good thing? That's a great thing. Let me paraphrase this. The Holy Spirit will gradually heal you. The Holy Spirit will gradually reconfigure our soul and our mind, our will, our emotions, all of that, all of who we are, the real you in your soul. That's the real you. He's going to reconfigure all of that to make us back into the image of how God the Father originally created us to be. And I love that about the power of the Holy Spirit working through and in our lives. Reconfigure us in such a way that now we're going to take on God's nature and his character in our lives. Jesus' nature and his character in our lives. That's what the world is looking for. We take on his nature and his character. How many are married here? Okay, how many are happily married here? <laughs> Just checking. Whoa, hands were a little slow there. <laughs> the wives instantly looked at the husband. Well, there's this, there's this something. Now, I'm, I'm going to be in my fifth year in, of marriage soon, in this summer. Yeah, hallelujah. Okay, some of you have been married 50 years. Okay, so take it easy. <laughs> some of you have been married 50 years, so hopefully one day I'll get there. You know, the more I spend time with her, we have now come to this thing. We, we, I, I call it a game. Okay, she knows me more than actually I know her. And this that I guess that woman's intuition or the way women are made up, you guys just kind of know, right? It drives your husband nuts and drives guys nuts because you just know, all right? And so we have this game. I'm going to talk about her because she's not here. Um, we have this game where I always ask her if we're going somewhere, I'm like, honey, um, where do you think I want to eat? It's always where I want to eat, Okay. <laughs> Never where you want to eat, okay? It's, it's honey, where do, where do you think I want to eat? And it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. I don't kid you. She's probably batting a, a, a 95%, okay? A, is that right? Batting 95%. The few times I have to change it up in my mind last minute. But tell you what. She knows exactly, without even telling, you, telling her what kind of food, where, I'll say, honey, where do you think I want to eat? And boom. And I start laughing because I can't believe it. I mean, I'm busting out laughing because <coughs> I can't believe that you just picked that place out of the blue. I just thought about it, and you knew what was in my thoughts. How many husbands does that happen to you? You don't want to lie, right? <laughs> Some of you, right? right. It's, it's like this. The more you spend time with one another, the more integrated you are, pretty soon you start taking on the other personality of the person that you're very close to. Pretty soon you start taking on some of the characteristics. Pretty soon you start taking on some of the mannerisms because you just spend so much time with them. You just know them. In the same way, at a higher level spiritually, the more time you spend with the Holy Spirit in prayer, in the Word, in, in, in communion with Him, with God the Father, Jesus Christ, the more time you spend with Him, the more of their nature and character will be inputted into your life. That's what happens. And the reason why some people say, man, I feel stuck in life. I feel like I'm not changing my question and my submission to them is, are you spending time with the Holy Spirit? Are you spending time with Jesus? Are you spending time in his word? Let the word wash you, cleanse you, teach you, equip you. Because when you do that, trust me, you're going to become more like Christ. And how many, how many of you desire to be more like Christ? We all do. We all do. Can I hear amen? The Holy Spirit works in us and is working in us, but he wants to work through us. The picture that I want to put up on screen is this. I went sailing once on a lake in Arizona. It wasn't like this boat, it was a much smaller boat. Um, and I didn't know anything about sailing, and I actually got seasick, so it wasn't a great experience for me. It really wasn't, okay? They said, Paris, you're going to have a great experience on this lake. I said, okay, and I got sick in about an hour. 
But a sailboat, if you want to drive, not drive, but if you want to steer a sailboat and get out on the ocean or a lake, right, and you can read all the books about every sailing apparatus, paraphernalia, whatever you know. You know how to tack. You know what aft is. You know what, what starboard is. You, you can know all of the information. You can even get on the boat. And you can start out. And you can lift the sails. And it can look great. But what's the difference? The, what's the one thing that's missing? Is what? Wind. Everybody say wind. The wind. That sailboat, no matter how magnificently decked out it is, no matter how much you know about sailing, everything about that boat, that yacht, that ship, whatever it is, you might know everything about it. But if there's no wind... You're not going to be able to go anywhere. Same thing in our faith with Jesus Christ. A sailboat without wind is like a disciple, a Christian, without the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing. It won't go anywhere. When you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, there is a measure of the Holy Spirit in your life. And he starts to work his sanctification in our lives. But there is something that happens right, when we don't continually fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. Eventually, we can know everything it is to be a Christian. We can dress the part. We can say all the Christianese words and all the Christianese languages that are out there. We can bring the biggest Bible to church. Okay, and it's not the Bible anymore. The biggest iPhone to church. <laughs> All right. We can, we, we can know scriptures from Genesis 1, 1 in the beginning all the way to G Revelations 22. All we can know it all. But if the Holy Spirit is not blowing in our life, if it's not moving in our life, it's like just walking in quicksand on that boat, sailing on the ocean, but not going anywhere in life. That's what the Holy Spirit can do. It brings you life. It brings you the wind of God. It brings wisdom. It brings all of the, the fruits of the Spirit that can be evident in our life when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then when we splash it out on people. 